Good evening. Um, thanks for turning out such great numbers. Uh, my name is Stefan Rutter. I'm a lecturer at the Government Department at LSD. Uh, um, uh, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture by Catherine Thelen from uh, the MIT. Uh, the title of which is Trajectories of Liberalization and the New Politics of Social Solidarity. Uh, Catherine is former professor of political science at MIT. She's a permanent external scientific member of the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies uh, in Cologne, in Germany. Um, she <coughs> focuses in her research on uh, the origins, development, and effects of institutional arrangements that define distinctive varieties of capitalism across the developed democracies, which is very much uh, the type of research that she's going to talk about and, and update tonight. Uh, the most recent book here is How Institutions Evolve, the Political Economy of Skills in Germany, Britain, and the United States of Japan, which uh, has uh, become an instant classic of its uh, publication in 2006. Uh, and she's also the uh, co editor of uh, two very important volumes in comparative political economy one uh, with James Mahoney explaining institutional change, and the other beyond continuity uh, with Wolfgang Schrey. Um, and uh, I should say that there's been a trend in uh, comparative political economy and perhaps in comparative politics in general of Americans increasingly explaining to Europeans how European politics functions quite, <laughs> quite successfully. So it's, it's a kind of talk to in reverse. Uh, and I think uh, Catherine Taylor has been very much at, at the forefront of that uh, development. So, so we're very, very glad to have her here tonight. Um, I should mention that there's a uh, suggested hashtag, if anyone wants to Twitter about what's going on uh, tonight, that is LSD Phelan. Uh, the whole event is video recorded, so uh, it's going to be posted on uh, the LSD website. We'll go on for about uh, 45 minutes of presentation, and then we'll have time until just briefly before 8 o'clock for uh, the question and answers. Uh, CMEs, of course, as you know, feature more coordinated bargaining, uh, 
uh, at higher levels of social partnership uh, between highly organized associations of employers uh, and also unions. Whereas liberal market economies are characterized by much more fluid labor markets uh, and rather weak employment protections, CMEs, of course, feature much stronger employment protections uh, and uh, generally much longer uh, job tenures. And finally, uh, whereas LMEs feature highly stratified systems uh, of education uh, organized around the production of general, which is to say portable skills, uh, CMEs feature uh, systems of vocational education and training uh, organized around the production of firm or industry specific skills. And these are, of course, systems that have also traditionally uh, provided avenues also for working class youth uh, to uh, move into relatively stable uh, and well-paid work, especially in manufacturing. Now, from the beginning, of course, the uh, core argument uh, of this whole body of work uh, was to challenge the idea that contemporary market pressures were going to drive a convergence on a single best uh, or most efficient variety of capitalism or version of capitalism. The idea really at the heart uh, of the varieties of capitalism framework uh, was to insist instead that these two models represent different ways to organize capitalism. You know, they do different things well. Uh, they operate on rather different logics, but both are said to be durable uh, even in the face of new strains. So this has obviously been an enormously influential argument. It's also been a really reassuring ar argument uh, especially for people who might otherwise worry uh, a lot about the breakdown uh, of the institutions characteristic of these coordinated market economies, which are, of course, uh, associated in, uh, in all of our minds with a more egalitarian variety of capitalism. So what I want to do uh, in this talk is three things. Uh, I want to start by sketching out the debate uh, in the literature as it has unfolded over the past few years, uh, and try to situate my work within those debates. Uh, second, I want to propose a new framework uh, for thinking about different trajectories of change across these countries. Uh, and third, I want to turn to some empirics uh, and try to illustrate the argument that I'm developing uh, by sketching out some important trends uh, across two uh, key coordinated market economies, namely Germany and Sweden. And I guess the last prefatory uh, remark that I want to make is that my goal in all of this uh, is going to be to shake up uh, a little bit, uh, much of the conventional wisdom, which is really that the, 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 the core idea that the best way uh, to preserve egalitarian capitalism is through a vigorous defense of the institutions that have traditionally characterized coordinated capitalism. Okay, so that's the argument that I want to construct here step by step. But let me start with the, the, the current debates. So my work is set within the context of this sort of ongoing debate uh, in the literature between two broad and broadly divergent uh, perspectives. On the one hand, uh, we have this kind of classic varieties of capitalism perspective, uh, which sees the divergent institutional arrangements characteristic of LMEs and CMEs as pretty robust and resilient. Okay, these authors are gonna point out that many of these institutions, the, the institutions that distinguish the coordinated market economies have very deep historical roots. Uh, for the current period, the argument is that employers in the meantime have organized their strategies around the existence of these institutions, right? They derive real benefits from them. Uh, so they're not going to abandon things like coordinated bargaining, coordinated skill formation, because they now rely on these things uh, for their success in the market. Now, clearly, scholars in this camp uh, acknowledge some of the important trends and changes that have been going on uh, in these countries. But they tend to insist that these changes really don't uh, undermine the core logic uh, that separates CMEs from LMEs. And they're certainly going to resist the idea uh, that current developments are going to drive some sort of convergence uh, on the Anglo-Saxon model. Now on the other side of the debate, we have what I think of as a powerful liberalization theory. Uh, and I would say that this is best represented uh, in recent work by Wolfgang, uh, by Wolfgang Strain. Now scholars, in, but there are others who embrace this position certainly as well. So scholars in this alternative camp perceive in contemporary developments a real breakdown uh, in the arrangements that have distinguished these coordinated market economies in the past. They're gonna code a lot of the changes that 
you know, rise of capitalism people see as sort of adaptive, they're going to code them as instead deeply transformative. And they do see coordinated market economies uh, as moving in the direction of the Anglo-Saxon model. And the reason is, of course, that they have a rather different, far less benign view of employer interests, right? For these scholars, capitalists everywhere are only ever trying to extend the reach of the market. Uh, the only thing that distinguished these coordinated economies in the past was that in the past, for various really historically contingent reasons, a society had been able to put up somewhat stronger defenses. So the lines in this debate are really pretty sharply drawn, I would say. But the debate itself has been sort of strangely inconclusive. Uh, even when scholars from these two different perspectives are, are looking at the exact same institution, they're often reaching rather different conclusions. You know, is this system, are these systems falling apart, uh, or are they holding together? So one reason for this, I think, uh, is that different authors uh, are often uh, simply focusing on different measures or different aspects of an institution. And I'll just give you uh, one example among many possible ones, uh, namely industrial relations institutions in Germany, which is, of course, a classic uh, CME, the classic CME in the uh, original drawings of capitalism uh, volume. So when the economic crisis began, uh, there was this big debate over whether or not globalization would uh, drive a breakdown uh, in centralized bargaining arrangements. So various scholars at that time started collecting data to see uh, if this was happening. And what you have here is just a couple of graphs uh, that track change, or actually lack of change, uh, in Germany in terms of two of the more common measures uh, of bargaining coordination. And basically what you see here is that in terms of formal bargaining structures, uh, Germany is really just as centralized today as it was in the golden era uh, of the 1960s. Now, of course, documenting a high degree uh, of stability in formal bargaining structures uh, may not tell the whole story, may not even tell the main story. So others have, of course, painted a very different picture uh, of the trajectory of German industrial relations uh, based on tracking trends in collective bargaining coverage. And so what we see here uh, is that even if these contracts are still negotiated centrally, uh, then they're now simply covering significantly fewer workers uh, than they used to in the past. So these two pictures are just meant to show you know, how easy it is uh, to see how different measures could lead, uh, lead scholars to rather different conclusions, even if they're looking at the exact same uh, institution. Is this glass half empty? Is this glass half full? Now, if the disagreement were purely empirical like that, uh, then I think reconciling those views would be rather straightforward. Uh, but in the meantime, I've really become convinced that uh, the disagreements run a good bit deeper than this, um, in that scholars on different sides of this debate are often, in a sense, almost operating on wholly different analytic planes. Right? The varieties of capitalism literature has, in my view, very usefully uh, directed our attention to the issue of employer coordination employer coordination as the core key feature that distinguishes the liberal from the coordinated market economies. So following that lead, uh, a whole lot of the literature on stability and change has been organized around trying to evaluate how well employers' coordinating capacities are holding up. So for example, this is, this is precisely what uh, Peter Hall and Daniel Gingrich uh, were getting at in an important article from 2009 uh, where they look at a variety of measures and they basically find that yes, actually, uh, employer coordination is holding up pretty well in these CMEs. Now the problem that critics of varieties of capitalism have with this argument is not actually that they dispute the empirics. It's just that they are not interested at all in employer coordination. They're interested in social solidarity. So I think Strait puts this very well uh, in the distinction that he draws between Williamsonian uh, and Durkheimian institutions. It seems very clear to me that the varieties of capitalism framework in many ways is most concerned with the efficiency effects uh, of all these various arrangements like coordinated bargaining, uh, uh, coordinated training regimes, and so on. Uh, these scholars are thinking of these institutions uh, primarily as institutions through which employers can achieve joint gains through strategic cooperation. In other words, I'm thinking about them in terms of their Williamsonian functions. Meanwhile, though, 
uh, critics are really assessing something else entirely, uh, namely the solidarity enhancing effects of these institutions, or what Drake is calling their Durkheimian functions. You know, to what extent do these institutions support high levels of equality, income and benefits, uh, or not strong social protections for all? Now, oddly, and to my mind, unfortunately, uh, the debate as it has evolved has mostly actually skirted these deeper uh, issues. Uh, and instead it's been played out in these disagreements that focus on how far liberalization, very broadly defined, uh, has taken CMEs in the direction of <laughs> LME type arrangements. And when you pose the question in that way, you're almost inevitably going to do two things. One is that you'll end up situating countries on a single continuum which of course reduces the whole question of change to movement along that continuum. Uh, and second, in consequence, you will also tend to conflate the notions of coordinated capitalism uh, and egalitarian capitalism. These are two phenomena that did in fact uh, seem to coincide in the, what we now think of as the golden era of post-war capitalist development, but which are analytically of course completely distinct uh, and which don't necessarily go together. So here's a little figure that just tries to clarify uh, a little bit visually what I'm saying here. So here we just start uh, on the x-axis with this kind of standard distinction between LMEs and CMEs, which I actually do think continues to uh, capture something uh, pretty important about the way that different political economies uh, are organized. But of course what we knew all along uh, is that there's variation not just between LMEs and CMEs, uh, but also between uh, or among CMEs themselves. So one dimension of variation represented on the y-axis here that I've tried to draw attention to uh, in some of the work that I've done comparing Germany uh, with Japan uh, is between what we might think of as more encompassing or solidaristic uh, varieties or variations where the institutions for you know, collective bargaining, employment security, and training cover all or almost all workers versus more segmentalist, or what people are, including myself, are nowadays more likely to call dualist uh, systems, such as Japan, where it was really only uh, core workers uh, in large firms that were covered by those arrangements. So if you go back to this uh, case of German industrial relations that I just was talking about, even if employers' uh, capacity to coordinate uh, and conclude centralized contracts remains robust, you know, if more and more workers are falling outside these contracts, then it seems to be clear that we're moving from a more solidaristic to a more dualist variety of co uh, coordination. So all of this, to me, uh, speaks to the need to sort of open up the analytic space uh, a little bit more to disentangle the, I think, more complicated and not linear relationships sort of co-evolution uh, of egalitarian capitalism and coordinated capitalism. Uh, and that brings me to the framework uh, that I want to propose to think about this. So this is the framework that uh, takes off basically from joint work that I did with Peter Paul, uh, in which we basically argued that the term liberalization uh, that's really at the center of all of these debates may simply be too encompassing to be very useful in assessing the meaning and, and the significance of the very different developments that that term often subsumes. So, you know, there may be some sort of family resemblance between Danish flex security and some of the reforms that Margaret Thatcher introduced uh, here in the UK in the 1980s that both involved liberalization in some broad sense. Uh, but it seems clear that to advance the debate, we need to make uh, some finer distinctions. So simplifying greatly uh, and drawing on a broader literature, I want to suggest that we can distinguish at least three distinct, ideal typical trajectories of change. And they're depicted uh, in this figure. And they correspond to what I want to call liberalization as deregulation, that's the red arrow uh, in the lower left-hand corner, um, which is, I, I suppose, associated ideal typically with LMEs. Uh, liberalization as dualization, which is the black arrow uh, downward in the middle, which is associated especially with uh, many of the Christian democratic uh, political economies like uh, Germany. But I would say that Japan is also a pretty uh, clear case of this. Um, and liberalization through what I'm calling socially embedded flexibilization, which is the blue arrow moving uh, right to left uh, at the top, uh, associated with the social democratic countries, but I would say the Netherlands is also uh, a case of this, although in a somewhat different way. 
Now, all three of these trajectories of change involve liberalization in some broad sense. But distinguishing the three uh, is simply meant to recognize that liberalization can take many different forms. And especially, it can occur under the auspices of rather different social coalitions. And that's going to matter a lot for distributive and other outcomes that we might care about. So let me just, for clarity, go through a few uh, definitions here. So liberalization, as I'm using it, uh, involves really an active political dismantling of coordinating capacities really on both sides of the class divide. Uh, and with that, a strong move toward uh, what Jacob Hacker calls uh, an individualization of risk. Okay, so you can think of things like the dismantling of compulsory arbitration in Australia and New Zealand, the dismantling of uh, uh, collective bargaining rights under Thatcher here, or for that matter, uh, the, the recent assaults on, on uh, public sector union bargaining rights in many uh, US states today. Dualization involves the differential introduction of market forces uh, into previously regulated spheres. So here, traditional protections are really left in place for labor market insiders, even as the number of labor market outsiders expands. Now, unlike deregulation, uh, which is going to proceed identically to a sort of direct assault on employer offensive, a direct assault on traditional uh, institutions, and therefore involves conflict between labor and capital, dualization is actually often fueled by an intensification of cooperation between labor and capital uh, in the core, uh, in core firms, core industries, but where such cooperation is underwritten by an increase of flexibility outside the core. Uh, socially embedded flexibilization finally involves the introduction of new forms of flexibility, but in a context in which you have a continued, strong, and encompassing collective framework. So active labor market policies and flex security are really the signature policies here. So in these cases, we are observing uh, liberalization in the sense of a departure, a significant departure from the kind of market suspending uh, institutions that we've long associated with strategic coordination, a la varieties of capitalism. You know, these employment guarantees, specific skills, all of the things that I mentioned in that first slide. But what distinguishes this from sheer deregulation uh, is really that these moves are embedded in policies and politics that, uh, so to speak, uh, support really the most vulnerable in society. And with that, they involve a collectivization rather than an individualization of risk. Um, the other aspect of this that we don't have so much time to talk about here, but I'm more than happy to address in the Q&A, um, is that you know, for those of you who may be familiar with some of the work that I've done uh, on, on modes of institutional change, I, I argue that each of these trajectories of change is uh, associated with a specific dominant uh, mode of change. So deregulation uh, is, I think, identically uh, strongly associated with what I'm, in some of my work I've called institutional displacement. Uh, dualization is associated with what Jacob Hacker has called uh, institutional drift, uh, and embedded flexibilization associated with what I think of uh, as institutional conversion. The point, though, of opening up the analytic space in this way is that it's going to allow us to see combinations that are really hard to talk about or even hard to sort of think about if you're working with this unidimensional model of change that I was talking about before in which the notions of coordinated and egalitarian capitalism are tightly coupled with one another. Okay, so for example, dualization involves declining equality but in the context of continued significant coordination of the number of, uh, of uh, workers inside this core is shrinking. The other uh, embedded flexibilization involves continued rather high levels of equality, uh, but in the context of policies, especially active labor market policies, that could really only be characterized as liberal uh, in the sense of market conforming, market countenancing. Indeed, radically so because they are precisely not premised on protecting people from the market, but by uh, actively adapting them or encouraging their adaptation to it. So just so this is not completely abstract, what I did here uh, is situate several key countries in this little figure that are based on some of the measures that sort of tap the concepts around which this literature that I've been talking about 
uh, has been organized. So here the x-axis is based on a very simple index composed of really the usual variables that varieties of capitalism scholars use to capture differences in employers' coordinating capacities that matter for labor outcomes. So these are just indicators that I took right off the shelf, the power of peak employer associations, labor management cooperation, uh, and the extent of wage coordination. The y-axis, by contrast, uh, is based also on a simple index, but one that captures some of the outcomes that uh, have emerged in this whole uh, growing literature on dualism. So uh, collective bargaining coverage, that's the, the variable that I showed you earlier with the, the downward uh, slope in the German case. Um, uh, involuntary part-time employment as a measure of irregular or atypical employment uh, and long-term unemployment uh, as a measure of the extent to which some groups are simply excluded from the labor market uh, really altogether. And mostly what I want you to see here is that while Germany and Japan remain you know, stable on um, many of these uh, varieties of capitalism uh, dimensions, uh, this has really not at all prevented their moving rather strongly uh, toward much higher levels of uh, inequality and dualization. And this is exactly what we have learned. Um, we know that both countries have seen a very sharp increase uh, in income inequality and also in uh, poverty over the last 15 to 20 years. In fact, both of these countries were singled out in an important recent OECD study for their rather bad performance uh, on those dimensions. But I also want you to notice that Denmark and Sweden have uh, managed to maintain relatively high uh, even slightly increasing levels of solidarity used by these measures, despite actually some formal institutional uh, liberalization. Okay, so that's a very stylized picture. It says nothing uh, about the politics uh, that lie behind these different uh, trajectories. Uh, and so that's what I want to find, but that's what I want to talk about now. And I want to talk about the politics in three passes uh, by talking about the interests by talking about political dynamics uh, and talking about the policies uh, associated with these last two trajectories of change, namely dualization uh, and embedded flexibilization. So let me start with interests. Now remember that the varieties of capitalism framework uh, is based on the idea that coordinated capitalism is held together by a confluence of interests uh, between labor and capital uh, with respect to certain institutions and practices. In particular, uh, organized employers and unions are seen to be jointly invested uh, in some of the key institutions, which include you know, centralized rather than decentralized bargaining, strong employment continuities rather than very fluid labor markets, uh, and education and training systems organized around the production of specific rather than general skills. Now, it may be obvious uh, to everyone why unions support these things, but remember that the core, the sort of key claim here uh, is that these arrangements are stable because organized employers <laughs> do support these things, although for their own probably different reasons. I actually think that's right, uh, or at least I find lots of evidence for this. But I think it turns out that it's only right for manufacturing. Okay? And so as important as manufacturing remains to many of these economies, for the politics, what actually matters everything uh, is that employment and manufacturing across all of these countries is down to between 10 and 20 percent. Uh, so the shift to in employment uh, to services has really upset the political dynamics because both firms and workers uh, in these emerging service sectors have interests that are really quite distant uh, from those of their counterparts in the industry. So on the employer side, uh, service sector firms really across all the economies that are you know, liberal and political and coordinated market economy, they're just more likely to press for uh, more flexibility in the labor market and for more labor uh, wage differentiation. And partly, obviously, this is just to reduce costs, but partly labor mobility and wage differentiation uh, play a very different, more prominent, and often quite positive role uh, in the emerging service sectors. For example, in high-end services, uh, labor mobility and wage incentives do in fact seem to provide important supports uh, for ongoing skill acquisition. And actually, this is one reason why CMEs in the past have often experienced uh, somewhat severe, in many cases, severe skill shortages 
uh, precisely at the high end. More generally, though, the service sector or service sectors tend to thrive more on general rather than specific skills. Obviously, this is true in terms of high-end skills like you know, software engineering, which is obviously, these are obviously very portable skills, but at the low end as well. For example, in the retail and hospitality industries, uh, where a, a high-quality public school system that provides foundational general skills is arguably, in many ways, much better equipped uh, to than traditional firm-based apprenticeship uh, to generate the kind of social and communication skills uh, on which that kind of firm relies. On the labor side as well, though, uh, the shift to services has really brought new interests to the fore, perhaps especially importantly for the politics, those of a growing number of working women. Uh, and here it's actually not at all clear uh, that these new constituencies are really all that well served by many of the arrangements that were so important and so central uh, in an era of manufacturing dominance. For example, uh, research has shown that women are distinctly disadvantaged uh, in countries that feature uh, traditional firm-based apprenticeship. They do a whole lot better uh, in school-based training uh, that emphasizes general skills. Uh, moreover, at least as long as social protections remain strong, uh, more fluid labor markets uh, may actually be more congenial from the perspective of workers uh, whose employment records are more likely to be interrupted uh, for family reasons. In other words, we're talking about constituencies here that face a, a very different set of risks, or not just the old risks, you know, threat of unemployment, loss of benefits, and so forth, um, although those still obtain as well, but new risks as well, uh, associated, for example, with single parenthood, uh, or for generally for the need to reconcile work uh, with family life. So emerging interests outside of the traditional manufacturing core uh, are actually pretty different, uh, and that uh, shakes up the politics. So turning to the politics then, uh, of course, many explanations of uh, diverging trajectories uh, of change uh, in welfare states and labor market policy and so on uh, does focus or has been focused on what policies, what exact reforms uh, different kinds of governments have been pursuing in the last two decades. Um, and much of that is, of course, very valuable. I've done some of that myself. But what I want to argue here is that how these politics in this transition play out generally is really very profoundly shaped uh, by the legacy of policy choices that really go back to the golden era itself. Um, and here I draw a lot of insights from sort of older work, actually, by, uh, by John Stevens. So I'll just remind you that in the social democratic countries, as we know from that previous work, uh, the modal response to labor market shortages uh, in the 1950s and 60s was to mobilize women. Uh, and their entry into the labor market then fueled the demand for services that were then arose to support female employment. And so what that means today, or the legacy of that, is that we have a large and a well-organized public sector that forms a very important second pillar uh, within the union movement, and one that actually represents a rather different constituency with many different interests from those of the traditional male-dominated uh, manufacturing unions. In fact, uh, unions constitute a majority uh, of the organized labor movement in many of the social democrats, the Scandinavian countries. The electoral impact of those changes is uh, also, of course, important. Uh, because the mobilization of women and the associated expansion of the public sector um, transformed women, as we know, into a very reliable kind of core constituency uh, for social democracy in the welfare state. In the Christian democratic countries, by contrast, the response to labor market shortages in the 50s and 60s was very different. Those countries, uh, of course, turned uh, typically to uh, recruiting foreign workers. Uh, while meanwhile, women stayed at home in rather large numbers and supported the traditional male breadwinner model through their, uh, the, you know, through their providing of uh, unpaid care services and unpaid uh, household services. So what that meant then is that the public and service sectors remained a lot smaller, especially uh, in relation to manufacturing, uh, which has in turn allowed manufacturing interests uh, to continue to dominate both producer group politics uh, and really public policy. Uh, among other things, uh, the structure of union membership in these countries really continues to reflect uh, much more the employment patterns really from the 1960s 
heavily dominated, uh, heavily concentrated uh, among male blue collar workers in, in manufacturing and very weak uh, in services. What all of this meant electorally uh, is that this alliance between working women and left political parties that we know uh, to have been so important in the social democratic countries um, simply never materialized in these countries. Just the opposite, in fact. Uh, in these countries, women often remain dependent for the, also for their benefits uh, on their husbands, many of whom continue to be uh, employed in manufacturing. And actually, uh, when women did enter the labor market in these countries uh, in the 1980s, but especially in the 1990s, what often drew them into the labor market was the need to supplement family income in a period of high unemployment. In other words, I think it makes a huge difference uh, that in the social democratic countries, women were entering the labor market in a period and in the context of extreme labor market shortages, uh, whereas in most of these Christian democratic countries, they were entering in the context of high unemployment and heightened uh, economic insecurity, entering, in other words, as secondary supplemental earners. Um, and this fits exactly with what Torben Iverson and um, and Francis Rosenbluth find in their recent book, uh, which is that where traditional family structures persisted longer, uh, married women are more politically conservative, and they, of course, rationally oppose policies uh, that could be expected to raise taxes on their insider uh, husbands. So my argument for the present is that those countries in which producer group politics continue to be dominated by a cross-class coalition uh, rooted in manufacturing, the trend is likely to be toward dualization. You know, for all of the reasons laid out in the varieties of capitalism literature, uh, manufacturing firms and their workers can in fact be expected uh, to jointly defend for themselves uh, these traditional institutions and practices while on the unorganized periphery, you know, more flexible, less secure forms uh, of uh, employment emerge. Now, unions may or may not oppose these developments. Sometimes they don't. Uh, but even where they do, uh, being only weakly anchored in, in the service sectors, uh, they're pretty poorly placed to come with these trends. Uh, in the social democratic countries, uh, by contrast, where service sector workers and low skill workers generally uh, are better organized and incorporated, importantly, where they're incorporated into institutionalized decision-making venues, producer group politics and electoral politics paved the way uh, for these more encompassing reform coalitions. But where I, I also really want to emphasize that these coalitions are representing a very different logic, uh, one that reflects these uh, somewhat different interests that I was talking about earlier uh, of actors outside the industrial core. So to illustrate the political dynamics, let me turn finally uh, to the polit policies uh, and sketch out briefly developments in two countries, uh, Sweden and Germany, uh, across three different institutional agreements that pretty much everybody agrees uh, are important to the outcomes <laughs> that I'm talking about here. Namely, industrial relations institutions, uh, vocational education and training, uh, and labor market policy. And I'll go very quickly here. I'm really going to only hit on, on sort of the, some of the main headline trends. Uh, much more could be said under each of these headings, uh, and I'm certainly happy to elaborate on any of this in the, uh, in the questions. So let me start, though, with, uh, with Germany, where the trend really across all three of these realms, uh, I argue, has been toward an intensification of cooperation within the industrial core, uh, but in the context uh, of a, a, an expansion of essentially unregulated uh, periphery and with that uh, growing inequality through dualization. So industrial relations, uh, I've already previewed the pattern here. Uh, the story is one in which uh, manufacturing firms in particular uh, do continue to support industry-wide bargaining you know, against uh, liberalization theories. There's really been no frontal assault uh, on traditional bargaining arrangements. And in fact, there are many signs uh, of uh, intensified cooperation uh, between labor and capital in the interests of preserving what remains an extraordinarily successful export model uh, up to and including a very spirited defense uh, really shared by unions and employers alike uh, for the principle of collective bargaining autonomy, tarif autonomy. Uh, and this is something that they jointly, absolutely defend, uh, even in the face of this overall erosion of collective bargaining uh, coverage outside the core, especially in the service sector, where unions never really took root, 
uh, and where uh, and where uh, traditional institutions are, are weak or non-existent. There are other aspects of this debate on minimum wages, uh, the whole issue of wage, wage scales, uh, a recent uh, labor court decision, I won't go into all of that. There's more that could be said about this though. Um, vocational education and training. The German apprenticeship uh, system uh, is really the crown jewel, as you know, uh, of the German model. This is widely regarded still as a key institutional support for Germany's, again, very successful export sector. Again, there's absolutely no sign that anyone wants to liberalize or dismantle this, uh, this system. On the contrary, uh, you've had over the past decades tremendous support uh, and tremendous cooperation between labor and capital uh, to defend the traditional system. Unions and employers in Germany speak really with one voice uh, in arguing against introducing some kind of school-based alternative to traditional firm-based training. Uh, they have worked together you know, hand in hand at the national level uh, to implement reforms that over the past years to adapt, uh, adapt the system rather uh, to technological and other developments uh, in terms of production technologies and so on. So the quality of German apprenticeship training, which was already really high, uh, has only gotten better. The problem is uh, that all of this upgrading has increased the cost to firms uh, of training. So training is technically much more sophisticated uh, and firms have to train to these higher standards. So many firms can no longer afford to do this. And this has pr produced uh, an overall shortage in apprenticeship slots, which German youth still absolutely want. But we have a shortage of apprenticeship slots which is in turn, turn you know, sort of translated into a rationing of training as firms then cherry pick uh, the best students while other, other kids, especially those from lower class backgrounds uh, or immigrant backgrounds in particular, uh, are simply left out. Which is to say that we have trends in training toward dualization to, so to speak, go along with the dualization trends that I talked about uh, in industrial relations. And finally, labor market policy. Germany has been correctly praised uh, for the way that uh, the economy and manufacturing rebounded uh, after the recent crisis. You know that unemployment rose uh, really in almost every single country except Germany. In Germany, unemployment actually declined slightly. And a big part of the key to that outcome uh, can be and has been traced back to the so-called short-time work policies. Uh, through which the government essentially uh, provided subsidies to firms uh, that reduced the working hours uh, of employees as an alternative to layoffs. So basically the government compensates uh, between 60 and 67 percent, depending on family status, uh, for workers' lost income. Uh, and then what often happens, especially in big firms like Daimler, is that the firm itself will then top that up to 80 or 90 percent uh, so the workers uh, actually who are affected by these programs actually experience very little uh, reduction in income despite their reduced working hours. Now, short-time work subsidies of this sort are in principle, of course, uh, available to all firms, uh, but the actual use of these programs is completely dominated by manufacturers. So in the recent crisis, 80% uh, of workers who were supported by these short-time work policies were in manufacturing, despite the fact that manufacturing in Germany only accounts now for 20% uh, of employment. And the reason, again, is completely consistent with varieties of capitalism. Manufacturing firms absolutely want to hold on to their skilled workers in these kinds of downturns, and they are more than happy to receive uh, government support to do so. But firms outside manufacturing, and particularly those that um, employ large numbers of low-skilled workers, are not interested in uh, these kinds of programs. Now I have to say, this is an extremely popular program. All Germans, it's like the vocational training system. Every German who will tell, or of course, 90% will say that they love this program. And foreigners, too, very much admire this program. Paul Krugman, during the, in the aftermath of the crisis, in the New York Times wrote article after article in support of uh, this kind of program. He was just enamored of this program. And I certainly don't want to dispute the importance of this program uh, these short-time work policies for having helped uh, German manufacturing rebound after the crisis. But I do want to point out that these policies are not even remotely redistributive. They redound exactly to the same labor market insiders that anyway enjoy the strongest job protections uh, and the most generous benefits. 
So the bottom line is across all three of these realms in, in Germany is that we have a successful defense of traditional institutions and policies uh, that have long served and continue to serve the industrial poor. But this is in many ways been a kind of recipe for institutional erosion uh, and rising inequality through labor market globalization. The pattern in Sweden is very different. And here we have a case where we observe trends that I think are very perplexing uh, against the backdrop of the kind of classic varieties of capitalism arguments. Basically, across all three realms, we have very strong liberalizing moves, uh, but implemented, actually, in ways that protect the interests of the most vulnerable workers. So again, let me start with uh, industrial relations. So the first big move, and the one that everybody sort of focuses on when they talk about Swedish industrial relations, was the move from uh, peak level bargaining to uh, industry level bargaining in the 1980s. What most observers then miss is a whole second round, or second wave uh, of decentralization in the 1990s that essentially took the system very strongly in the direction of firm based wage formation. So in Sweden today, uh, only 16% of workers have their wages set uh, at the industry level. For all the rest, uh, bargains, you know, the bargains that are laid out at the industry level only lay down parameters for local bargaining, which is where the actual distribution of individual wages gets set. Now, in some cases, uh, these industry bargains set out what's called wage kitties um, that local bargainers then uh, distribute. They can distribute them unequally across workers, that the wage kitty is set at the, at the industry level. But in other cases, the industry bargain doesn't specify any number at all. It doesn't specify any amount. Uh, it just lays out principles that local unions and firms uh, are meant to follow. This is, in many ways, much more decentralized than the German system, which still has wage scales and so on. Um, but what it is not is deregulated. Uh, what distinguishes this system from, say, the United States is that it's unions and not individual workers uh, that are negotiating the terms and the extent of wage differentiation. And this is really, of course, especially important uh, at the low end uh, of the wage spectrum, where you know, in the, in the United States, for example, you know, wages at that low end are simply offered on a by employers on a kind of take it or leave it uh, basis. But whereas in Sweden, local bargaining uh, by unions is specifically well, often organized around shoring uh, the position of low skilled, low wage workers. Uh, education and training. The big trends uh, in Sweden here are again very different uh, from Germany. Remember, in Germany, we had this sort of joint defense of a national skill system uh, organized around firm based training, uh, and which is also by the way, uh, involves a pretty continued uh, sharp distinction, a uh, sharp line between the academic and vocational tracks. Uh, in Sweden, the main trends in education policy are decentralization, the integration of academic and, and vocational tracks, uh, and essentially marketization. So Sweden had already moved in the 1960s uh, from a more apprenticeship-based system to a more school-based system of vocational training. A, a move, by the way, that was really very much driven by the entry of women into the labor market, it turns out. Because in that period, vocational schools basically outcompeted traditional apprenticeship uh, with women, as women entered the labor market that period. Since that time, there's been a series of changes over the years to, to further integrate the vocational and the academic tracks. Uh, which, of course, is moving this whole system further and further away from a specific skill uh, kind of system to more general training. Uh, the most recent big move on this uh, front was in 1992, when a year was added uh, to the uh, vocational track at the upper secondary level, and that brought it in line with the, uh, with the academic track. Uh, and the curriculum was changed uh, so that all students, no matter which track they were on, uh, got the same uh, core subjects. The other big and interesting trend uh, in Swedish education policy uh, that you may have heard about, and which is a very the big deal now, uh, is the so-called choice revolution. Uh, and this has involved a very significant decentralization, uh, but also the uh, founding of independent, which is to say private uh, schools, uh, and the introduction of more choice uh, for parents among public and private uh, options. Uh, so these are the kinds of moves that, you know, in the United States, we certainly associate with you know, vouchers and marketization 
this is a very liberal market kind of economy uh, thing to do, but the way that they've been implemented uh, in Sweden is, of course, very different. Uh, in that context, uh, private schools are not allowed to sort of pair, you know, pick and choose uh, which students that they take. They can't, uh, they can't charity pick. Uh, they get the same funding uh, as public schools, and really importantly, and very different from private schools in, in the U.S. at least, uh, they're not allowed to top up um, the to top this up by charging additional fees. Uh, so as a result of these changes, you have more market, you know, more choice, uh, but within a collective framework that also guards against the kind of stratification that you get uh, in many LMEs. This has been actually uh, controversial, as you can imagine, uh, but I've seen studies that show that these for-profit schools in Sweden have actually had their biggest uh, and most positive effects on precisely on kids from low uh, socioeconomic status backgrounds. Finally, labor market policy. Of course, Sweden you know, famously pioneered uh, the use of active labor market policies as part of the famous uh, Red Miner model uh, of the 1940s and 50s that was really premised on actively moving uh, workers out of declining industries and into sectors uh, where, you know, emerging sectors where there, was new, there, there were new longer term employment opportunities. Uh, but as many observers uh, have noted, uh, Sweden really drifted away from those principles uh, in the 1970s and 80s, a, a period in which policies came to be organized much more around, stro uh, around stronger employment protection. This was the period of the voter termination laws, uh, <laughs> passive support for the unemployed, and especially very big subsidies uh, to shore up declining industries, particularly manufacturing. Even Josta Ren himself, which was of course one of the architects uh, of the Swedish model, uh, noted at that time that labor market uh, and industrial policy had very much strayed uh, from the original deal uh, and had done so in the face, by the way, of tremendous pressure from employers and unions in manufacturing to shore up uh, Swedish industry in that period. So current labor market policies, basically since the 1990s, uh, have basically returned to uh, the older model. They are much more activated, uh, but they're also combined with relatively strong supports uh, for placement, especially training, this is kind of the Swedish uh, version of uh, flex security. And as an aside, uh, I might mention that uh, during the recent financial crisis, unions and employers in manufacturing in Sweden really went hand in hand together to the government to ask for the kind of short time work policies that I was just talking about in the German case, but they were absolutely turned back, uh, you know, went home uh, empty handed. So in Sweden, uh, what we see across all three of these realms are some very significant liberalizing moves. These are moves that I think are really hard to square uh, with the kind of classic CME type arrangements, uh, but where these market countenancing, uh, market promoting moves have also been embedded in various kinds of social policies and measures that prevent the country from sort of plunging into higher levels uh, of inequality. So let me just sum up very briefly. So you remember uh, at the beginning of the talk, uh, I said that the conventional wisdom, uh, I would say shared by both varieties of capitalism scholars and their critics, the conventional wisdom is really that the best way to preserve egalitarian capitalism uh, is through a vigorous defense of the institutions that have traditionally anchored coordinated capitalism. And I said that I was going to try to shake that up a little bit. <coughs> so at a minimum, what I hope I've demonstrated in this like, little sketch of developments in Germany and Sweden is that not every defense of traditional institutions is solidarity promoting. Uh, and conversely, that not every move toward liberalization really has to uh, compromise social solidarity. And maybe more provocatively, the general uh, sort of idea that I want to kind of plant with you today is that we may actually be moving away from a world in which high coordination, a la rights of capitalism uh, is always associated with high solidarity and conversely where everything liberal uh, necessarily means unequal. We may be moving away from that uh, to a situation in which court, uh, continued coordination uh, sometimes uh, comes very much bundled with uh, higher levels of inequality while liberalization or at least certain forms of it uh, can indeed be associated with higher levels uh, of equality. So thank you for your time and uh, I look forward to your questions.
runs, so straight away you have to uh, wait a second until you have uh, able to speak to everyone who's really well, I just think it's the floor now. Hello, uh, my name is Bruno Starr. I've been working, sorry, uh, I've been working in, uh, in the last few years in, uh, in the Danish uh, parliament. And I must admit, I, I can't really recognize your picture of, uh, of the Scandinavian model. Uh, I think one thing that was, uh, was absent um, from, your, from your point was um, unemployment benefits uh, um, and the level of the level and the period of those uh, pensions and these uh, conditions uh, at least have been, uh, have been hollowed out, uh, have been cut in the last few years. Uh, in Denmark, um, the flex security system, in my opinion, is almost gone, at least hollowed out, and we have seen. Um, uh, yeah, um, the the large period, uh, the period where you get the good benefits are down to two years now. Otherwise, you you send out, um, and um, it's been a lot. It's a lot harder to get uh, into good employment, uh, unemployment benefits. So we're moving towards, uh, and um, I must let much less universal system that we've been uh, previously. Uh, and there have been a quite a large rise in the Scandinavian countries in uh, in inequality in the last few years. I think the reason it's not been shown in Sweden yet uh, is probably uh, that they are doing quite well economically, so we haven't seen a rise in, uh, in unemployment there yet. <coughs> comment on that? Um, well, I certainly, wouldn't. I certainly, yeah, I try not to be too, uh, as they say in German, blue-eyed about the, uh, about the <coughs> too optimistic about the Scandinavian uh, cases. All of these things are relative. Right? And so all of these things are in relation to other alternative models that are, uh, that where we've seen even higher rises, even higher levels. So I, I, I really don't want to dispute that there has been austerity across the board. Absolutely, there's nothing, there's, 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 no, uh, there's no dispute there. Uh, but in terms, but if you look at the, at the Scandinavian cases relative to other cases, it is a, it does seem to support higher levels of equality. Now I also, I mean, the, the main thing, the main thing that I, the main difference, two main differences. One would be something that I haven't talked about. I didn't talk about social policy very much at all. And some of the sort of, I talked about industrial relations. I talked about uh, labor market policy, which is not the same, obviously, as social policy. Uh, and I talked about training policies. Um, and so if we talk about social policy, yes, there have been, there have been cuts, uh, across the board. Um, but still you have higher levels of sort of support for the, the, the most vulnerable, so to speak, in society. That's one thing. The second thing that I would say distinguishes different models of flex security or, or, or sort of activation. Everybody's got activation, you know, across the board, also you know, liberal economies. Uh, the question is, what are they, what are the services that are provided to individuals? Um, and so in many cases, activation just amounts to, you know, you know, hetzing people. In some cases, it involves some help with job searches. But in some cases, it actually promotes, it actually supports um, uh, real training that, that, that at least has the potential to lead to, to employment. Does it in all cases? No. And so one difference that I would make across the various models of flex security that are out there and that really are across all of these countries will be on that dimension. Um, the other thing that I uh, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention um, escapes me at the moment. Oh, it was on, it was on, uh, just on the on the general point of not being too too rosy eyed about uh, about these things. I'm also very aware that um, some of these countries in Scandinavia, uh, but, but some of the countries that are most touted as successful models of especially flex security, like Denmark, the Netherlands, and so forth. I'm very aware, too, that, um, and there will be something on this book, on this aspect of it in the book that I'm, that I'm working on, that I don't know that, it, I, I don't think that 
it's necessarily a coincidence that some of these countries that, that have maintained higher levels of social solidarity also feature some of the more uh, radical right, you know, sort of radical right parties. I don't think that that's necessarily the, I mean, there may, it may be something about how the community is, is supportive, but, put, but you put up strong barriers to sort of outsiders and so on. So it's, I think you're quite right to point out that, that I shouldn't be too blue-eyed or too um, optimistic about, about, these, uh, about these cases, but relatively speaking, if you look at uh, figures on employment, uh, the wage inequality and so forth, things like that, it really, the Danish and the Swedish cases look really much better than, than the, the US and, and the continent of the US, I'm sure that. If, um, if you're a woman and you're a writer and um, you're an artist, um, would that be, be classified as labour or would that be not labour? Um, would you, as a woman and a writer and an artist, be classified as unemployed or non productive or um, because of course, eventually, if you're good and you're gifted, you you, you mount to something, you, you you get money. But what about that? Those years when you're unknown, would that be productive? Would that would that be classified as productive? If you're, I missed the first part of the question. If you're, if you're, if you're a woman and you're a writer, an artist, but because. Um, like Shakespeare or something, or Picasso, they had, you know, they were really gifted, so, you know, and they were men. So that, that would involve different kind of politics. But women have only been recognized as such till the 20th century, or that was when they become recognized. So would that, would that be economy, or would that be being disobliging and not working? It's, it's whether or not they're in paid employment. And, and, yeah, I mean, if they're, they're, if they're not in, in paid employment, it's a little bit outside my framework, for better or worse, probably for worse from your perspective. But um, my, the, the, the population that I'm thinking about are those are potentially in, in employment. But I will say something about, um, about sort of socioeconomic, sort of elites and socioeconomic sort of high-end producers um, in the services. This is not your artists and so forth. But it, it occurs to me that, or it, it's occurred to me, I was talking about the different interests of different uh, groups within the labor market. And one of the, and, and the, uh, the kinds of policies that, that cater to those, uh, to those kinds of interests. And it seems to me that sociocultural elites, these are kind of the winners uh, as a result of uh, the growth of the service sector and the uh, technological changes and so forth. You have a, a group of professionals and semi-professionals who are, and they are an increasingly important constituency of social democratic and also especially, I would say, green parties in many countries. Um, and these people uh, support the welfare state, actually. Uh, but they support a different kind of welfare state, right? They don't, th these are not necessarily the high-end professionals are not necessarily as wedded to the, the traditional, the, all of the, the, the characteristics of the CMEs, and the, the institution's characteristics of the CMEs that I, that I was talking about, you know, like strong employment protection. Often these, these are professionals, uh, I'm talking about sort of engineers and soft, whether men, women, whatever. Um, and they, they benefit from, they want uh, sort of much more labor mobility. And so I think one of the pressures that's moving us left parties in this direction is the is this transition and is the growth of this uh, group as an important constituency alongside their traditional core constituencies, which is the traditional labor, uh, the traditional manufacturing working class. And so there you have this kind of tension, and you can see different left parties sort of leaning one way or the other. Um, so it's not a perfect answer to your question. I haven't really thought about your response. The, the Um, hello, I'm a master's student in international political economy, and uh, I would like to thank you for your interesting lecture. Um, so, as I understood it, you mostly accounted for the 
difference in CMEs, how they incorporated their service sector and how they moved along the lines on the axis you showed. But um, could it be that the difference among, among CMEs can also come from the way the access finance, because an important feature of the VOC is how firms access finance. And therefore, like more generally, how um, also the financial crisis may uh, affect the model of CMEs and how they move under liberalization equality access with regard to their finance. Access. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. And it's one that I, I, I need to do, I need to do more of, uh, more with. I think Jonathan has written on uh, finance in, uh, in uh, is this right, on Germany, where it, it changed much less than you, than you thought. I was reading a bunch of, uh, uh, so some of these countries, the, the whole finance aspect, you know, patient capital and all that stuff, changed a lot less than you, than one might have thought in that sense. Uh, but there is a bigger question, and different countries are just differently affected by the, by the, 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 the meltdown. Um, and so, you know, the, the uh, you know, Greece and Italy are just in a completely different uh, sort of world, so to speak. They have different. They have a different menu of options. It's a much more limited menu of options than uh, than other countries, even even other countries that were uh, affected by the uh, by the financial crisis. And I haven't folded that in. I probably should actually. I I probably should fold the uh, finance into this picture because, of course, if I were going to do the complete. You know, compliment. I'm not. I personally am not too wedded to the whole notion of complementarities. Uh, but certainly, if I want to cover all of the bases that were covered in the in the varieties of capitalism uh, uh, volume, then, then finance would have to be and, and corporate governance would have to be in there. Um, but I guess what I see is that you know, in those countries too, faced with these kinds of sharper trade-offs, um, what you often get, or what you surprisingly get, really, is uh, is a uh, are, are, is, a, is a real hunkering down and a, and a real dualization where the core is simply a lot smaller because uh, the uh, because the, the manufacturing core itself is uh, is smaller and more weaker than in countries like say Germany. Um, but it's a, it's a very good question and one that I think I probably have been trying to avoid. <laughs> Um, I found it very convincing and the real contribution that you make that you add is the political forces that lead to a particular reform processes in, in your, your framework, like you know, the social democratic pattern goes towards event flexibilization and there are forces that lead to dualization in the Christian democratic um, CMEs. What I wonder though, what then, if we have dualization in Germany and such countries, how does that go together still with the Williamsonian institutions? How can a CME like Germany have its dualized labor market? Um, one highly coordinated, the other almost, you know, LME within. Um, if presumably manufacturing firms that also need high skilled service sectors and perhaps the uh, previous speaker had something on it that, you know, the finance that you get, the quality of other services. What happens to that if you have this dualization? Um, that's, that's also a great question. Um, I think economically, a high level of dualization is very sustainable. Um, I think politically, it's, it, it's the big problem. Um, that is to say, I mean, I think, you know, the Japan has had high levels of dual, of dual labor market dualism for a very long time. So I think economically the thing can persist. Because, of course, what, what manufacturing, let's talk about Germany, you know, what manufacturing in Germany really wants is, is, um, is uh, a, a sort of strong, sort of continued uh, training for high-skilled workers in, in manufacturing. But they, but they want to buy a lot of their services on the cheap. So they actually, they're not at the forefront of liberalization because they want to maintain a lot of these traditional institutions. They certainly don't mind the, the, the service sector drifting into uh, in a low skill you know, sort of sector because a lot of stuff that they want to buy, cleaning services and, and delivery and all that stuff, is very low skill. On the high skill end, it's very interesting. Because what's going on in Germany now 
is um, essentially that the vocational model is bleeding into the academic model in the following way. Those, you're quite right, they need high skill. You know, one, one half of all VW workers today have the abitur, have the college, uh, the, the high school diploma that allows you to, to go on to study. One third of uh, workers in the, um, in the biggest Mercedes-Benz factory are work in research and development. These, these are top blue color. These guys are engineers. Okay, so what do they do to get their engineers? They, the newest trend and in, in, in Bavaria, it's, in Bad Wurttemberg, it's very widespread, is for firms to work in collaboration with uh, local technical universities or universities to get their curricula um, uh, adopted. So they work with these universities. Um, and what they do is the only way that you can get into those training programs, you cannot just apply to that university to get into those training programs. It's called the dual study program in Germany. And Daimler does it, and Bad, it's very big in Bad Wurttemberg. Uh, and it's spreading now, slowly but spreading. Uh, and the only, you can't just apply, can I you know, go to Technical University X? You have to be hired, in order to get into this program, you have to be hired by the firm. And then, with, with, then as, a, as, a, as an apprentice, and with, with that access, you suddenly now have available to you college level, college level courses, and, and you will get a college credential. So you're earning both a practical and a college credential at the same time. And what's interesting to me about that is that I see this as the vocational model bleeding into or sort of uh, invading higher education as opposed to you know, the other way around, which is how you could also imagine it, where the, the, the higher education model would you know, sort of dominate the, uh, the vocational model. So I see these firms addressing what you correctly point out is their real needs for skills at the high end, engineering skills, but they're doing so in a way that captures, captures curricula uh, in these higher and these institutions of higher education. And it's, I think that's a very interesting and not wonderful, not wonderful development because that's really a dualization. Then. then we're talking about people who just do not get any apprenticeship. And then at the low end, and then people who have only have access to these to these uh, engineering degrees that actually segue directly into uh, into work afterwards. Um, I mean, they're really I can't say again. It's very high quality education. These, these kids are very well served. I know a lot of parents who want their kids to be exactly in this system, as opposed to just in just in uh, getting a, an engineering degree in the traditional way. So I think they're they're addressing they're trying to address those skills themselves. Me personally, I study the, the, the development of vocational training over a long period of time, and to me it reminds me a little bit of uh, developments in the early early uh, 20th century when um, when firms were, were which dominated global economies were essentially running their own schools. Uh, so I know a little bit about that. <laughs> As good as these things are, in terms of technical skills. Thank you, uh, Gerhard Schiele, King's College London. Um, I wonder about the Swedish case, what do you think about the change that happened in 2006 in terms of politics when you know, the centre-right Polish government came to, to power? I mean, in my view, I fully buy the story, obviously, up to that point. But since then, I think there has been a massive increase in realisation. So first uh, question that was asked. And in particular, it's interesting to see the role of the female workforce in these changes. One important change in Sweden has been that uh, these uh, cleaning services were made tax deductible. Uh, in order to, I mean, one of the arguments that interestingly, historically, in the 1990s, the main uh, force behind these changes were the feminist groups of the Social Democratic Party, because it was argued, we female workers, we work as much as our husbands, but we do much more at home. So we work the double shift, basically. So we need tax deductible home services in order to kind of equalize uh, in our society in that sense. But what has happened since is that this, this home services, clean services uh, sector has expanded massively. And people work there, I mean, are basically female, but from Poland and Russia. 95% are, are foreigners. 
and they have horrendous working conditions and very low salaries. Right? So, in a sense, what has happened is exactly contrary, in a way, to your argument about female workers being a support for you know, the, the welfare state, basically, in the sense that in Sweden it has actually worked the other way around since 2006, when some of these reforms are actually pushed for by rather this constituency uh, at the expense not of, of, of the Swedes, but uh, at the expense of the immigrant workforce. Work. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. It goes back a little bit to what I was saying about who, who are the, it's not like everybody's, everybody's a winner that they're, that they're Right. I mean, I've tried to characterize it in strong <coughs> terms uh, against the German case, but I too actually think that Sweden suffers from a lot of sort of dualism tensions. I think that they've been resolved differently, unless uh, uh, they've been resolved differently, partly because manufacturing interests. One sees this is actually in industrial relations as well. Manufacturing interests are extremely powerful, but they're not. They can't dictate uh, dictate to the rest of the labor market. One sees this uh, a lot because the um, the, uh, the main employer uh, 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 association in, in, in metal working uh, always, you know, they can't they can't control outcomes, so they often have to like leave the, you know, they just left the industry agreement and then they go back in. But uh, it's a sort of it's a position of weakness because if you could actually dictate outcomes, you would just stay in and just rule the roots, right? But these guys have to sort of throw in the towel occasionally to get everybody to then sort of rally around to. to Consolidate the model. Uh, so I, I, I think that there's there's a way in which um, uh, there's a way in which Sweden does suffer from more uh, dualist or segmentalist urges, and I would say that does have a lot, uh, in fact, to do with um, the manufacturing. It is still pretty important. It's dominated by us. You still got these large uh, these large firms, although much more open internationally than Germany. If you look at foreign direct investment, much higher in, uh, in Sweden than it is in uh, in a country like Germany. And then the other thing is, yeah, I thought, of, you know, it's not like it's not like the, the public sector unions that are dominated by women always win in any way, shape, or form. I mean, they lost massively in the privatization and the and, and all of the uh, the changes in uh, in Sweden in the 19, uh, especially the 1980s. So I really am arguing against uh, sort of characterizations of the of the Scandinavian countries, in particular Sweden, as you know. The macro corporatism, and so everything is very consensual and stuff like that. There's a new book coming out by a very good friend of mine, Kathy Joe Martin, and Dwayne Swank, which is very, which is very much about macro corporatism and solves these. And I see macro corporatism as falling apart all the time and being patched together. And those are the interesting politics that I'm actually after. Um, and so I do see a lot of tensions. I also see a lot of tensions between sort of workers at the low end and these high level semi. Professionals or semi-professionals, the ones that I was talking about in answer to, the, uh, to one of the previous questions, and there I think that there are real conflicts of interest because a lot of these semi-professionals, of course, live off of uh, exactly the kinds of, I mean, you know, sort of like live off the exactly the kinds of uh, services that, that you know that, that are provided by those um, by those uh, by those kinds of developments. So I really don't want to blend all that out. I, it's, I make the comparison possibly too starkly. Uh, in this context, to sort of draw the, the difference to, to Germany, but in the, the I should run some of this past too, uh, if you're willing to read some of it. But in the book, I try to to be a lot more nuanced and say, look, here are the conflicts. Here's where the thing. Uh, here's where the thing uh, really um, uh, really uh, created a lot of conflicts, uh, also and especially among women, even right. And in the German case, you also see a lot of conflicts among women um, over a lot of issues because you have. You know, on many jobs, for example, you have women who work as a second job and just use it to supplement. They don't need the benefits. These things don't have benefits associated with them. Some women really defend that. They really want. They don't want benefits because that's going to reduce their take home pay. And whereas other people who die for that I mean, really need those benefits. So I do try to characterize. It's not just like there's women and they're a lot and they support uh, the welfare state. There's a lot of complex um, also in the scandal. So it's an important point, uh, one that I need to sort of re-emphasize, and uh, I think you're right. All right, so Dennis, thanks for the part.
Thank you. I'm just, um, again, on the speed, sorry, could you remind me? I'm Dan Zio of the government department at the LSE. Um, in part, I was just thinking um, whether there's a sort of a Peter Katzenstein element to this. I mean, Sweden is about a about, about tenth the population of Germany, but Sweden and Germany both have roughly 50% of their GDP in sort of export. Um, and that's sort of dominated by manufacturing. So, but, so the firms themselves have to be much smaller uh, because, you know, in Germany you've got 10 times the population. Um, in which case you have firms that are sort of acting to try and be more flexible and then sort of in, uh, shifting to new technologies much more quickly, not sort of doing the same kind of, kind of slow adaptive change that you might see in some of the German more, um, more technical firms. So, I mean, I guess my question is whether you might see dualism that since, since the numbers are smaller, you don't, um, the, the, the people who are on the inside who have to sort of be a little bit more flexible at the firm level are um, sort of less noticeable than in Germany where the, dual, the insiders, are, they're much larger, much more sort of organized together um, at industry level, that kind of thing. So the insiders being, the, yeah, I mean, it, the, the numbers are small, the I mean, it's actually, I, I don't unfortunately have it with me, but the, if you look at, I, I think about, uh, Employment and manufacturing in two ways. One in terms of employment and manufacturing, which is which is higher actually in Germany than in Sweden, but we're talking about all numbers between 15 and 20 percent, so they're not. But then you can also think about it in terms of the what you might think of as the strategic importance of manufacturing uh, to the economy as a whole. And there, there's m more variation. But uh, if you if you array countries in terms of like what share of export of, of, of value is is is, is export. Um, in Germany and Japan, it's like way, it's very high, it's much higher than in <coughs> Okay, so there are some differences there. But I think what you're arguing is pretty consistent with the way that I think about it, which is it, it may not be so much a sort of absolute number of people uh, 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 employed in manufacturing, but you said it's, you know, it's not a big difference there. It's that in Germany, manufacturing interests just dominate uh, pol producing of politics. They're, outside manufacturing is just very, you know, on both sides of the classified. Although service sector employers are better organized than service sector workers. Um, but the, there, there's a vast difference between uh, Germany and Sweden in terms of uh, who, when you look at the organizational landscape, I mean, I don't know these figures exactly in my head, but I. I I think I remember that seven of the ten top unions uh, in Germany are are service sector unions. Or, uh, um, yeah, I think that's right. So we're talking about an institutional landscape that is just vastly different uh, from Germany, where the service sector is just very poorly organized and where um, uh, manufacturing is, is sort of just dominates uh, dominates. This. You, you see this, for example. Well, you see this in a lot of things. The, the debates on minimum wage, for example, where manufacturing unions are not that, not, they, they, they finally came around to, in Germany, to um, supporting a minimum, the introduction of a minimum wage. But they're not, it's not something that gets their blood really going. They don't, you know, they're not, it's not their, it's not, some of them, like the chemical workers, are, don't want it. You know, they worry about putting down the pressure. But the Metal Workers Union, which is the biggest, still the biggest union, um, now does want it, but is not going to the mat over that. All right, we're running out of time, so I can take two more questions, but I think we'll think I've had the hand up for, for very long. That's just the gentleman in front. But if you could keep it very concise. Um, hello, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite new to, to a lot of these ideas, but I was just I was just wondering, what do you think about the idea about um, the government at the moment in the UK and their sort of advocacy of like of like new business and trying to get new businesses to develop? So I understand there are some 
success stories in that area, but do you sort of understand why it might be hard for the public sector and do you think it's a bit sort of part that the public sector is sort of sometimes being avoided nowadays and sometimes being cut in ways which some people might see as a bit unfair? Wait, so I'm not sure that I understand. Is it about, about immigration or is that what she said at the beginning? Um, or about the public sector? About the public sector and the way sort of the government is trying to do things now and the way they're sort of um, in, encouraging different different sorts of ways of employment and maybe sort of some people might see them as avoiding the public sector in some ways now. Or dismantling the uh, uh, yeah. assault on the yeah. uh, But that, that would be, I mean, that would be consistent with, yeah, so thank you. That would be consistent with what we might expect, uh, what would be less consistent, and this I think uh, Jonathan has written about, is the, is the, uh, the, um, the, Policies during the uh, during the during the previous during the labor governments where uh, where which were not were much less consistent with the sort of classic felony type behavior. I would I would think that the, the, the policies now are much more consistent with what you with a sort of straight deregulatory you know urge of the sort that it was represented by my by my sort of red arrow. Uh, but one of the things that I sort of like about the, the framework that, that I'm thinking about here is that, you know, liberal market economies can do a lot, can make a lot of moves. Like I would say, this, this UK move is, was really, uh, that's for higher levels of dualism or more inequality. Uh, but I would say that that was largely driven by the moves in the factory years. You could imagine you know, one, you know, some of the, the moves under the player and under new labor made of statutory wage and uh, things like that could have moved it back up and then and then now I would see it sort of going down and uh, going down again. Uh, it but a classic kind of you know, liberal move. There are a few hands up for for a while in the back. Uh, I don't know whether that's still relevant. Uh, yeah I think it was you when it's quite a long time ago. Uh, 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 I also keep very short but that'll have to be the last question. Uh, thank you. Um, it, it actually relates to the, the point that you, you just made about uh, the, the unequal liberal economies in your, in your uh, two by two. Uh, very interested in some sort of further thoughts on the, the most likely kind of trajectory for unequal liberal economies. And is there, or what, what are the prospects of moving up to your top left? Square, so you become a liberal uh, and more equal uh, country. Yeah. Um, well, uh, the, the 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 so I, it, it is a slightly more like look. Let's I the uh, the if it used to be the case that I mean the, the, it, it's more hopeful. Let me put it this way: it's more hopeful than sort of varieties of cap the, the sort of traditional varieties of capitalism. Because of course, in the traditional varieties of capitalism framework, you sort of either you had guilds and, and <laughs> developed along a certain trajectory in the um, in the 19th century, and that put you in a certain box, probably upper right here, uh, or, or or not. And it was it, it's hard to imagine, you know, since these are two stable and self-reproducing self, you know, reproducing equilibrium, that it would be hard to imagine moves out of that. So in, in that sense, there, there, there is hope. The, 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 what would you need to do? Unfortunately, so that's the good news, that there, that there are varieties of liberalism or liberalization that aren't necessary, that can be, that can support higher levels of equality. The kind of bad news is, though, that it seems that you need strong unions, which, uh, okay, we don't necessarily have. And the other thing, and this is just pilfering, uh, but I think it's just true that the only thing worse from the perspective of labor than you know strong and uh, powerful employer associations is weak and fragmented employer associations. So if I look at the landscape in the United States, we have very weak unions and very weak uh, uh, economic associations of business. I mean, political in, in the United States, business is absolutely well organized politically right now, but their agenda is a neoliberal one. And so 
I talk to friends in the United States who, who talk about the revival of the of the American labor movement, and it really starts in services, and one could imagine sort of building out from there. There are just other measures that are sort of solidarity <coughs> promoting. One is like a statutory minimum wage. That's a that's a move that's that's a positive thing. That's something that you don't have, all you need is a, a, a government that that is sympathetic. Um, and in the United States, of course, you need since the minimum wage has to be updated. You have to go through Congress every single time. You, you do need a Congress that's going to go along with that. Um, but in the UK, I mean, some of those things are, are sort of thinkable. Uh, thinkable. The, the public sector you can still have some uh, organizational sort of capacity or sort of, uh, sort of coordinated capacities and so on. So it's a mixed picture. It's not a totally, you know, like it was all set uh, a long time ago, but, um, but it's, I, I do think that organized interests are, are hugely important to this whole story. All right. Uh, so at this point, it uh, remains for me to, to point out that there's one more comparative politics lecture scheduled this uh, academic year. that will be by Pranit Chibber from uh, Berkeley on the 25th of April. That will be posted on the government website and on the uh, LSE events website. Uh, and other than that, I hope you'll join me in thanking uh, Catherine here for an absolutely happy